Bonjour, and we are going Greetings, relatives. Bidano Kodoko and Asian Kaz, Wabuche Shi and Dodem. Waswaganing and Donjaba. Good afternoon. Today is a good day. Mano Gijigad Nongom. My name is Tina Kukan Miller. I'm a citizen of the Lac du Flambeau Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe. And I have a profound sense of gratitude to be here today. And as I've heard the morning presentations and continue on, we see that we're weaving together this story. So I feel very grateful to be part of the colleagues and the friends who have helped be working hand in hand with Suzanne alongside her as she's done incredible work. And what's exciting to me to think about is that it's a story that's never going to end because in fact, the work that has been done, the foundations that have been laid will impact future generations. And so what an honor it is for all of us to be in the room with her today. I'm just very grateful. So the title for this section, um, what I'm gonna talk about in terms of sort of broad policy strokes, we've heard some detail and we'll get a chance to hear even more detail in the books that is being written by various authors. But um, looking at sort of broad policy advocacy and development, but then also bringing it home with some concrete examples. The title for this section reflects the idea that if you don't like the rules, then change the rules or create new ones. If you have the capacity and the courage to do it as well as Suzanne Harjo has done. Not only did Suzanne Schoen Harjo play a leadership role in the passage of key legislation, she also secured the federal appropriations and private funding for implementation of statutes such as the NMAI Act, NAGPRA, and the Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument Act. It's one thing to have a statute on the books, it's another to secure the funding that ensures that the actual work behind the intent of the statute is implemented. As we've learned today, Suzanne's been a key advisor to several presidential campaigns and administrations, including the Carter campaign, as well as during the Carter-Mondale transition. She then served President Carter as a political appointee in the Carter administration, where she was the congressional liaison for Indian Affairs. Suzanne has advised various administrations on presidential appointments to top federal posts, boards, and commissions. And as we all know, in 2014, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the United States' highest civilian honor from President Barack Obama. As president and executive director of Morningstar Institute, Suzanne collaborated with Native American Rights Fund and other organizations to form the Religious Freedom Coalition. They achieved the American Indian Religious Freedom Act Amendments of 1994, and the act provided protections for the practice of traditional ceremonies, such as within the Native American church, and enabled the first repatriation of sacred items to American Indian tribes. Ojibwe spiritual leader Bodwewood and Bene C has shared that in the early days of government housing, some Ojibwe homes were often carpeted, utilizing squares of carpeting. Squares could easily be removed to reveal holes in the flooring, which is where the lodge tent poles could be erected so that our people could continue to practice our ceremonies in secret, despite ha them having been outlawed by the federal government. Today, the Madewan lodges throughout the Great Lakes once again flourish, in large part due to the efforts of people like Suzanne and Shon Harjo, who fought the battle to ensure that our people would always have the right to be who we are and to practice our own ceremonies and life ways. In Ling versus Northwest Indian Cemetery Protective Association, the US Supreme Court examined whether the free exercise clause of the First Amendment applied to the practice of religion on Native American sacred lands. At issue was the proposed construction of a road through the Chimney Rock area of the Six Rivers National Forest in California, a religious site used by the Yurok, Karuk, and Talawa tribes. The court held that construction of the proposed road does not violate the First Amendment, regardless of its effect on the religious practices of the respondents, because it compels no behavior contrary to their belief. Determined to find another solution, even if it had to be created, Suzanne worked a, worked a group of activists who influenced Congress to intervene and designated the area as a wilderness under the Wilderness Act. As a result of persistence and strategic intervention, the road was not built. One of the most significant bodies of work that Suzanne engaged in over the course of her career whoop, has been to help settle Indian 
land claims and to keep the door firmly propped open so that tribes with long-standing claims for historic insufficient payment by the federal government could bring suit or seek legislative redress. While government representatives suggested there should be a statute of limitations for such claims, Suzanne worked to pass laws to extend the amount of time that Native people can sue for damages against third parties. Prior to 1996, there was no general statute of limitations applicable to the United States as a plaintiff, but there were limitations that related to individuals. In a statute of limitations for Indian claims hearing in 1982, Suzanne testified that the federal government had failed to comply with laws already in place to pay tribal nations what they were owed due to claims that they had already settled. At stake were claims involving railroad tracks, roads, and utility lines built on native lands without native permission, most of the land and water claims, and many other cases. As she worked behind the scenes to extend the statute of limitations so that tribal claims would not be lost, she found herself at the center of a whirlwind of activity, advising lawyers and policymakers alike, while also educating journalists as a self-described crisis manager and 2415 maven. True leadership includes public and visible acts, as well as the relentless pursuit of behind-the-scenes strategies that allow big-picture victories to quietly unfold. The court ultimately ordered the defendants to submit legislative proposals to Congress designed to resolve all of the claims if they couldn't be litigated prior to the end of 1982. Holding the doorway open for justice for tribal land and water claims is just one example of the many ways that Suzanne has provided leadership for Indian country over the decades, resulting in the return of over a million acres of land and settling countless other claims against the government. Anyone who has ever heard Suzanne share the memory of the time she and her mother encountered the bullet-ridden dress of the little girl who inspired the poem, Child of Time, has likely never forgotten it. The girl's often silent appearance in her dreams became a driving force for enacting Nagpra, after which time Suzanne says the little girl no longer appeared to her. Deeply impacted by the presence of the girl in the dress that she wore as she was gunned down, Suzanne embodies a kind of modern-day American Indian warrior who not only knows how to influence the legal system to right some of the wrongs done to Indian people, but perhaps more importantly, she allows her work to be guided by the spirit, and in that way, she is inconquerable. The experience encountering the little girl's dress at the Gustav Hay Center inspired Suzanne to work with many others to establish the National Museum of the American Indian Act, which authorized the establishment of the museum at two sites, one at the former Customs Building in New York, and construction of a new building in the mall. I'll never forget how Suzanne shared with my students in the Master of Public Administration Tribal Governance Program at Evergreen how she and a group of activists strategized to inspire a bidding war over the collection in order to gain the attention needed for the collection to be located in both New York and the nation's capital. Who knew that Ross Perot could have been one of the most influential collectors of native art of our time? You'll have to actually purchase the book in order to find out the rest of that particular story. When the NMEI opened on the Capitol Mall, there was a bus service taking visitors to the Cultural Resource Center in Maryland. I was surprised to learn that repatriation would be part of the services offered through the new museum. When I entered the museum for the first time, I was naturally drawn to a special exhibition called Anishinaabe Universe. As I entered a particular elk of the exhibition, I remember responding in my bones to a drum that was on display. I learned that it was one of the sacred drums of my tribe at Lac de Flambeau in Wisconsin. I asked one of our spiritual leaders about the drum and whether there were immediate plans to lay claim to it. I was advised that our ancestors would guide the pathway, and today I'm very pleased to share that that beautiful sacred drum did in fact find its way home where its voices sounded in ceremony once again. Since 2003, the Morning Star Institute has organized the annual National Day of Prayer to protect Native American sacred places, especially those that are threatened or endangered. A wide variety of commemorations and ceremonies are held throughout the U.S. at state capitals, um, in the nation's capital, on public, private, and tribal lands to raise awareness and protection of sacred sites. More recently, water protectors displayed the banner at the standoff at Standing Rock over the North Dakota Access Pipeline. Suzanne's work has been key to the return of various sacred places, including a 120-acre portion of Bear Butte, that was returned to the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes, who also steward the land on behalf of all Native nations who consider the Holy Mountain sacred. 
The land was obtained through a federal administrative purchase and conveyance in 1979. Suzanne also helped the Zuni Pueblo regain one of their most sacred sites as part of a water rights settlement through the 1984 Zuni Heaven Act, which protects the final resting place of the Zuni people. Black Elk Peak is the highest mountain in the sacred Black Hills, or Paha Sapa of South Dakota. The peak was originally named after U.S. General William Harney, whose troops captured and killed Lakota men, women, and children in the 1850s. Descendants of Chief Little Thunder, whose village was massacred and burned by General Harney, had been working to change the name of Harney Peak when a descendant of General Harney reached out to join the effort to change the name. Suzanne worked with the descendants, Karen, L Karen K. Little Thunder and Paul Stover Soderman, who testified before the U.S. Board of Geographic Names. The name was officially changed from Harney Peak to Black Elk Peak in 2016. And although the governor of South Dakota originally opposed the name change as a result of the unanimous decision at the federal level, the governor announced that the state would accept the change seven days after the decision by the U.S. Board. <clears throat> in achieving the Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument Act, the Morning Star Institute worked with the Cheyenne, Lakota, Arapaho, and Crow Nations to drop the Custer name from the battlefield designation, creating and protecting the sacred space of the Little Bighorn Indian Memorial. According to Suzanne, in 1991, the historic area was under the National Park Service jurisdiction with appropriate recognition of the American soldiers and called the Custer Battlefield, the only one in the federal system named after an individual, let alone the loser, right? Sometimes you just got a straight out quarter. <laughs> <clears throat> Most of the descendant native peoples wanted an Indian memorial on that hallowed ground where many ancestors fought and died, and they wanted a neutral designation of the place, not about individuals. The Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument. Suzanne referenced a peace treaty between the Crow and Cheyenne nations to build a powerful coalition of native nations and numerous influential members of Congress. Despite vigorous opposition by Custer Buffs and a Republican congressman, the Little Bighorn Coalition prevailed with the signing of the Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument Act a mere five months after the first congressional hearing on the issue. It would appear that the quickest route to getting something done in Suzanne Schoenhardro's world is for a government official to tell her that something can't or shouldn't be done. <laughs> the Indian Arts and Craft Act is a truth in advertising law that prohibits misrep misrepresentation in the marketing of Indian arts and crafts products within the United States. Suzanne and other colleagues worked on the amendments to the 1935 Indian Arts and Craft Act. Here are some of the criteria that defines whether a person is considered an Indian artist within the law. They're a member of a federally recognized tribe. They're a member of a state recognized tribe. But there's also an opportunity that if someone is certified as an Indian artist by a governmental body of the tribe, they also would be considered an Indian artist within the act. There are civil and criminal penalties that come along with prohibited behavior. And this came into play for us in our work at the Evergreen State College Longhouse. In the beginning, when we began to, our initiatives to support Native artists, we consulted with Suzanne and um, talked to her about the fact that we were going to be establishing our first Native art market and other regional markets. So with our mission to promote Native arts and cultures, it was very important that we had the Indian Arts and Craft Act as a foundational um, piece of legislation that we could utilize to guide our work. Our art market and regranting program have provided fertile ground for vigorous discussion at an educational institution around the eligibility criteria for participation. I, at the Longhouse, we're grateful for the guidance provided by the Indian Arts and Craft Act, which helps preserve the space for native artists to make and sell native art. Our Nooksack friend, Louis Gong, expertly established a new standard with his phenomenally successful eighth generation store, as well as the brand which boldly proclaims, support inspired natives, not native inspired. In her role as executive director of the National Congress of American Indians, Harja was a staunch advocate of treaty rights. She persisted in working with Congress to support Native American rights to traditional hunting and fishing. In the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, my tribe and other bands of Ojibwe came under literal fire for exercising our treaty rights to hunt, fish, and gather in the ceded territory of northern Wisconsin. Even our name, Waswaganing, references centuries-old ways of harvesting fish by torchlight at night. When the French trappers dis 
witnessed the practice, they describe what they saw as a lake of flames, also known as Lac du Flambeau. The exercise of treaty rights inflamed many of the non-Indian sports fishermen and hunters who organized into a variety of anti-Indian, anti-treaty rights groups. It wasn't surprising to learn that the lead organizer of Protect America's Rights and Resources was the principal editor of the local newspaper, the Lakeland Times. The media constantly misportrayed the native fishermen and women as over-harvesting and imperiling the fish and wildlife that are central to the tourism industry in northern Wisconsin. As the standoffs at the boat landings became more violent and intense, it was ironic that the official state slogan at the time was, Wisconsin, you're among friends. <laughs> we can see parallels among the groups that flourished in those decades with groups who are currently emboldened by the present administration of the United States with names such as Patriot Prayer and the Freedom Fighters. A fundraising tactic of one of the anti-treaty, anti-Indian groups known as Stop Treaty Abuse was the production of marketing of treaty beer. As a fundraising concept in northern Wisconsin, it could have been a very clever and effective ploy. Fortunately, treaty beer was a fail, in part because the beer itself was so bad <laughs> <laughs> that even diehard northern Wisconsinites had a limited appetite for it. Beyond the literal and figurative bad taste that it left in everyone's mouth, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Activists such as Suzanne Schoenhardt will help bring about Treaty Beer's demise. I'm still searching for a newspaper photo of a completely staged boycott of Treaty Beer in which she got Republican Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner and others to pour our Treaty Beer into a garbage can. <laughs> How Suzanne managed to get someone who at one point brought forward a bill to abrogate Indian treaties to pour the beer into this garbage can is a testament to her innate skills to influence people and to build unlikely alliances. I do, however, believe that our Wisconsin tribes missed an important counter-marketing and fundraising strategy. As Wisconsinites, we might have considered that the obvious tribal response to treaty beer could well have been the commodity cheese head. <laughs> <laughs> that could have been a great fundraiser for us in our continued advocacy. I look at the commodity cheese head and think, perhaps for days. So I leave you with this final slide, which demonstrates that Suzanne Schoenharjo descends from a long line of strong, indigenous, female ancestors who inspire her and motivate her to be the tireless Ogichi Dakwe or warrior woman, warrior woman that we need her to be. As a game changer and rule maker, Suzanne has influenced law and policy development in a way that will lift up our people for generations to come. Chimigwech Suzanne, Gizagian, we love you. <laughs>